welcome to another episode of Talking Art. I'm Jane Trejere, and I have another guest to present to you today. Uh, we have transitioned from one show to another at the Deerfield Arts Bank, and uh, look forward to seeing uh, more artists here and more art in the gallery. Today we have Janet Winston. Welcome, Janet. Thank you. Nice to be here. Good. And um, I, I start by asking where you come from and how you got here. So would you like to tell us where you're from and why you're here in this region? In this region, right. Um, I grew up in West Lafayette, Indiana, and uh, in a campus town. Um, Purdue University is there. So it's not dissimilar to Amherst and having a big university. Um, we came to Amherst, uh, where we've lived for 44 years, um, because my husband came for a, a second advanced degree, and we loved it here, so we, uh, we, we made it possible to stay. Um, and I found this a really wonderful arts-focused uh, community. Over the years, it, it became fuller and fuller in that respect. So we, that's Are why Are you I'm here. one of the um, founders of the A3 Gallery? No, I'm not one of the founders, but, but you're I a am member. a member. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have your work there on occasion. Everybody has their turn, right? We, we not only have um, an opportunity to have a show uh, once a year with another person or every two years a solo show, but there are group shows, so in December we always have um, a group show of small things. For the holidays, um, I will be in a show in January that's a, more of a drawing show, and in the summer we often have group shows. So there are other opportunities um, mm -hmm. besides just the one time you have your And you've also been show. in the Deerfield Arts Bank. You've been in... And I've been in this... Um, Deerfield Arts Bank, showing some of my work. Yeah, twice, I think, right? Right, mm -hmm. right. And um, So I and think I we're going to start with the pieces that you brought to the, um, to the Chair Dreams. Okay. Chair <laughs> Dreams. As I recall, those were, that you brought two paintings of two chairs. Mm-hmm. We'll get back to those. Okay. But be because I think that's, that's where your, some of your beginning of your work it, is, right? It's, mm -hmm. So tell us, um, did you study art in school, or did you become an artist later, or are you still wondering if you're an artist? Well, that, that's always a possibility. <laughs> I, um, I've always been interested in art, and I did major in art um, in college. I was a painting major and a printmaking minor, um, and both in my undergraduate and um, graduate degrees. Um, but I, I wasn't able to, I primarily worked in oils and watercolors, um, and it wasn't until about five years ago when I became a member of uh, ZMA's non-toxic printmaking studio in uh, Florence, um, just outside of, of Northampton, uh, when I really started to focus a lot more on uh, printmaking. So mm -hmm. that's been what I've been doing more or less the last four years. So when did you start really, after you've gotten your degrees, did you start painting right away? Um, I always painted. Um, well, how did you you, 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 you said something about, oh, paper dolls. Would mm -hmm. you tell us about paper well, dolls? Right, as I said, I, w I always like to do artistic things. And so when I was a little was a little girl, I used to make paper dolls, cut them out. That was back in the days when those were the kinds of things you did to entertain yourself. You didn't have all kinds of technical things. So um, I, I drew, I, I remember in first grade, um, we went to see the Indianapolis Symphony that had come to give a children's program in the morning to the school children. And then we were supposed to make a drawing of the orchestra and I was I I got the prize in first grade for the best drawing <laughs> because my little figures and I think they were probably all men then 
either were in black suits or um, brown suits or blue suits. And most other kids uh, didn't really bother to show the figure that um, distinctly. So, <laughs> do you still have the drawing? No, I don't still have that drawing. Oh, um, and you know, I, I think that's very hard to draw an orchestra. Yes, it was <laughs> with all the instruments. Uh huh. I think that's daunting. That's uh huh. Good for you. <laughs> So, um, so you always knew you were going to be following a career in the arts. I didn't. I, um, I also danced, and then at age nine I started playing the violin, and I did quite well in both of them. Um, my mother was a pianist, so music was important and, and um, abundant in our house. Um, but I didn't want to follow um, a music career. and. Um, I started as a dance major and realized that was not that was not what I wanted to do. I really wanted to be an artist, so I mean, in That's fine arts. That's interesting. I've I've interviewed a few artists who started out as dancers. Mm -hmm. I this was a new piece of information for me. Well, and, and even and even as a violinist. Um, my, the kinds of feelings I put into my music, I find I often can put into my art. I mean, you just sort of zone into a different um, space and different realm, and uh, and you can just be carried away with it and not be aware of time. Do you do you paint with music? Yes, I usually In the do. background. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I usually do. Well, um, so then medium. Mm -hmm. How did you choose your paint? What oils? Acrylics, watercolor, which is your I preferred? started as an oil painter, and um, and I did some watercolor back then. But I loved working in oil paints. Um, it, it, there's something very luscious and and uh, the fluidity of it, and being able to remove and add and um, just was has always been very appealing to me. It's a very different approach in watercolor because you can't control it to the same um, degree. If you don't like something in the oil painting, you can scrape it off or wipe it out and start again. But it's, it's more just the, the, even the tactile um, part of oil paints that are, that are so flowing and, mm -hmm. and luscious. And I, and I really can, I, I really There's something almost three-dimensional about them. Yes, and I don't care for acrylics for that very same reason. I mean, I've done acrylic paints. I, I work sometimes, I use some acrylics on paper, but I do not like using them on canvas. They seem more plastic. The edges um, just, they, they I are just, plastic. They are plastic, <laughs> and they feel that way, and the colors sometimes I feel are a little more garish than I want. It's hard uh -huh. to tone them down with the same kind of um, uh, subtleties that you can get with uh -huh. oil painting. I'm starting to really think that uh, the choice of medium really depends on different personalities. Mm -hmm. Probably the, the does. Fact, the fact that you can scrape off and do again versus watercolor where you touch the paper and it's, that's, that's, that's your mark. Well, it doesn't have to be. I mean, if you keep the watercolor paper wet while you're working on it, the, the paint flows, and you can control it by adding some water to push it back. So it's a different kind of technique because you're working with this water that you're trying to uh, guide in the direction that you want it. Um, if you want it with a crisp edge, then you do have to keep the paper dry. And, mm -hmm. um, you, and make then, sounding, you make sounding. You make it sound like to be a watercolor artist, you need to be a, a basically a water engineer. That sounds very <laughs> exciting to me. Well, I had never thought about it that way. Neither had I oh. <laughs> as an engineer. <laughs> no, right. it's like creating but it's dams. <laughs> <laughs> but it can be, you know, it oh, can be, yeah. um, and you can, if you, if you're using um, a cold pressed paper, a firm, roughy, rough kind of paper watercolor paper, then you can actually scrub off and wash off most of it without ruining the paper. Um, you won't get the pristine white, but you can get most of the color off and mm. start again. So there is some, 
some leeway. If you're working on a, a wet paper, so yes. I'll, I'll, maybe my theory is not so accurate. So, um, so you you started with with oil, mm -hmm. and and um, assuming you were painting all the time, at some point, some idea, some theme came to you that really dominated. Would you like to start there? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think that probably in the beginning I was I was a, a pretty abstract artist, and so the subject matter wasn't real clear, although they were more landscape oriented. Um, but in the uh, 1980s, um, well, I have to say I grew up in an area that was um, in the Midwest during the, the um, 40s and 50s, in the early 50s. Uh, the Ethel and Julius Rosenberg um, um, trial came up. Uh, they were uh, alleged uh, spies, and uh, they were Jewish, and they were very progressive. And uh, my parents were Jewish and progressive, and we lived in an area that was not, uh, there were very few Jews, and it was not a progressive state either <laughs> at that time. So. They had two young sons, and a uh, little younger than me, and to hear what was happening to their parents uh, being arrested, put in jail, they couldn't really see their parents, and knowing what they were going through, I really identified with how horrible this whole situation was. Um, and I always thought about that, and I started to read books, um, and it, um, I, I sometimes started to do some paintings that related to that. Um, but then I had a friend who, um, Rob Oaken, who, who started to collect artwork that was done at the time in the 50s uh, by well-known artists about Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. And uh, he wanted to put together some kind of exhibit. Mm -hmm. So I. I started to paint um, that subject more. And I have a number of paintings that show the figures of uh, Julius and Ethel sitting in big chairs, big throne-like chairs. Well, yes. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> to me, it was sort of uh, represented there being um, made as martyrs, so the th it was like a throne kind of chair, but it also kind of represented um, uh, the electric chair, without yeah. showing anything really realistic, visible electric right. chair. And in, in fact, they were not e electrocuted at the same time in the same room. They were absolutely not. This is my way of representing um, my concern and um, uh, interest in that whole situation with them. The other painting, the one where, where they're not in the picture, but the chairs are, that's what um, those two paintings, uh, the, that's what I had in the chair exhibit, Chair Dreams. Correct, correct. And I found that personally even more powerful, the empty chairs. They're not empty. There is a figure there, but they're shadowed. You right. just see sort of a, um, a black gray head. One's shorter than the other, right. and one has a woman's hair, hairdo. Uh, but I was focusing on the chair itself, and there are also lots of little scratch marks all around in the, in the atmosphere around it, which represented the energy right. uh, and the electricity. No, no, I, I found that the absence of their 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 absence, right, right, to me was even more powerful, right, than was just this a one. Shadow. So, so in painting this uh, large piece, what are the dimensions? This is um, not not so huge. I think it was about thirty six by um, twenty eight inches, maybe. Uh, some of them were smaller, and I even did a whole installation of four images of what was happening during that sequence of their being arrested before they were arrested till um, um, the last one showed Ethel as an opera singer because she always wanted to be an opera singer. And she would sing in prison 
um, and the only person that could hear her was the, the female guard. She, there was nobody else on the whole floor when she was there at Sing Sing. Um, and that was in a whole installation where s the viewer would come and sit down on a uh, bench and look through the, s the window screen and uh, see the painting on the back side of the uh -huh. box as though they were coming to visit uh -huh. the prisoner. Yes. Yeah. So that series... So that sounds like it took a, a chunk of your time. It did. It did. A psychic time as well, I would think. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So what did you move on to after that? Um, Staying in oils, right? I used oils, pastels. I even used some acrylic, but not, you know, they were mixed medias, some of them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and some of them so were just oils. I think the next big series that I went to happened in the 90s um, because my mother had, um, my father had died, my mother came to live with us and um, she was with us until it was clear that we couldn't manage it at home because of her deterioration and so she spent some time in a nursing home where um, she really regressed to the point of, of needing to be fed at mealtime and she was with other um, other residents uh, with dementia or Alzheimer's and I spent a lot of time watching these people and wondering what they were thinking about because they could no longer communicate. Um, well, this one here with the, um, the, the woman who's holding the doll mm -hmm. and I noticed there are paper dolls in the back. Exactly. And <laughs> I, I, I like that. that very much. And so that's what she's thinking about, yes? Well, that's Maybe. what I... That was you, what was you were thinking she was thinking I about. noticed that with my mother, her thoughts were about things that happened long ago when she was able to still talk. And uh, so I thought, they must be having, you know, uh, the mind f sort of cuts down on the short-term memory and the long-term memory is the last to go. So I, I figured they might be thinking about where they may have lived as a child or things they'd like to do then. And uh, so the way I represented these figures was in some way showing some of the items like um, paper dolls. This uh, particular woman actually held a little doll because that was comforting to her. Um, um, uh, this other figure, um, there are multiple um, indications of shoes and legs and hands and that's because she did not have control of her, her muscles. There were tremors and uh, so that, that shows that her hands and feet were always moving and then there's like a, a cloud above her head because um, we don't know what she was thinking about or even able to think. So this is just a mysterious uh, empty cloud. Um, the wheelchairs are, are a kind that they no longer use, but I changed them into something that was more like a, a little toy cart or um, a train wagon or, you know, some of, some of, one of the paintings has a group of residents and they are uh, sitting in chairs that are like um, a merry-go-round. You would find different animals and just things to sort of lighten did you show the whole this? situation. I did. And where did you get to show it? I showed it at the uh, Burnett Gallery in the Jones uh, Library in Amherst mm -hmm. in uh, 2000 and then it was shown again in the Amherst Town Hall in, uh, I don't know, about two th 2010 or 11 I think maybe it was. They're extraordinary. They're really beautiful. Um, and the color it's oil, but it's vibrant. It's that. Oh yes. yes. And it's it, there's something so jarring about the color and the topic. I find it jarring in a, in a positive way. I mean, it's jarring. It stops you. It's not what you'd expect, sort of thing. And it and it's um, it's very powerful. At the time when I first showed them in the uh, Jones Library, I had contacted the Alzheimer's Society in Massachusetts and they came with, they offered um, to have a little slide projection, uh, a sort of a, 
a, a changing scene of uh, some people talking, coming to visit family members who were in the um, in a nursing home, and uh, the whole time, and it was all it was very lovely. Everybody was smiling, and it was you know very tender. Um, and the whole time there was somebody reading poetry about what it was like to be um, forgetful to have reached this this point of not being able to be in touch with the outer world um, but still being quite content um, which was uh, I, I found a wonderful addition to the I'd like to exhibit. think that you were painting other things at the same time were you were you doing like your watercolors I, uh, I may have, but I have to say I was teaching, um, and oh, teaching I was a, an elementary school art teacher, and so my painting was not as prolific as right. you might have wondered, and it did take um, several years of working on this and working through them. Well, would you like to tell me how you got to, what came next, these or this? Um, they came, they came sort of, you know, several years together, but... Um, we have some more examples also. I, yes, I, I, I is, what, started to focus on the house, I uh, should say, my what, home. What is the medium here? These are prints. Uh, this, these are monoprints, and these all Can you explain monoprints? I please. will try. Um, monoprinting is working on a matrix, which in this case is a thin kind of plastic sheet, uh, one that you can scratch lines into and use like an etching where you rub the ink into the crevices and wipe off the surface ink and then when it goes through the press it leaves those line marks. So this one has some of this um, dry point etching. Here's one that also has some uh, dry point etching in the house and uh, the fence and a few, whatever the line is, is that kind of etching. Um, but with the rest of it, it's each color that you put on the matrix, the plate, and you put your paper on and you roll it through the press, that is a whole area of color. So I, I started with this very, very pale, sort of turquoise color, and then I would mm, ink up maybe a piece of torn paper, like here. Uh, this, this may have been a piece of torn paper. Um, they're inked up, they're put down on the, the paper. Separately, each time separately. Every color is a separate time through the press. So it's multiple times through the press. And because of that, you can only do one exactly the same. Oh, therefore monoprint. Therefore monoprint. What you can use again are these dry point lines on small pieces of, of uh, the plastic sheeting that can be used again. So I have several small prints with this kind of house but the other things are different, different colors, different well, backgrounds. I noticed that in, in the series that you had um, in the small arts for the big holidays here mm -hmm. at, the, at the Arts Bank, um, and some that you've brought in today, have the same square mm -hmm. at a different angle with different colors. Right. And here, and it, is, and here it is again. And right. here's one. This one is the most colorful, and this is a combination of um, an etching the little square etching with the half circles and the lines. And then this one I used watercolor and painted in some of the areas. On some of the other ones, they have a colored background and maybe just a few of the little triangles have been uh, painted in, but they have... Uh, you stayed each within the lines, I noticed. Each time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> each time it's a totally different print, although the etching the line, line part is the same but so you can the, the, adjust you, you, that around. So this piece here of these rocks right. you've used elsewhere. I have. I have several. That's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for explaining that. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. that's really wonderful. So you can take your own work and keep using it over and over again and as as and a basis for more things. And not as just an etching that is 
a whole edition. An etching that is an edition is exactly the same for whatever number that you want. So if it's an edition of 10, they're it's identical. A, it's they're identical, and it's uh, and it's numbered one over ten, two over ten. Right. If it's marked one over one, then you know that there's only one print of that kind. And um, well, if you're going so to paint in by hand, that immediately makes changes. it one. Right. Right. There is and no other one. And that can be called a variation edition. It's the same print but it's either put on maybe a different background color or the colors that are used in it are different um, and this so one says what does it say what did you write in there I can't read it at oh, the I moment <laughs> maybe I can read it let's see it, it looks like VE5 well that's it variation edition number five so I had it thank you variation it edition. doesn't tell you how many because they're all different, but right, it's just... Right, right. You could keep going. Right. VE 120. Well, <laughs> you could. <laughs> you could. So this is different. Right. And that one was um, actually before I started sort of focusing on, on the home. But this, these are structures. I, I like to mix um, geometric line shapes in a softer organic background. Um, wow. I often... Uh, have have worked with landscapes uh, throughout my painting, and uh, but I like I like the juxtaposition of very sharp, fine lines with um, background. But this one was some buildings. As a matter of fact, I was sitting at the gallery one day and I drew the building that I saw through the window, uh, the back of the building that was was what I could see and this little stoop uh, and staircase and I did a number of those with just line drawings and then painted them in different colors and added some little paper doll figures which paper still dolls. occasionally right. come up. I noticed that the paper dolls stay in black and white as if they're from a different time zone right. mm -hmm. and the rest is all color and there's some interesting design thing. Is that really there? Or is that you and your imagination? No, that was just me. That's just <laughs> you. my my yeah. imagination. I, I just I needed to make it colorful and light and airy and um, now so. that you've told me what it is, I'm going to go actually look because it's the view outside of the A3 gallery. Gallery A3. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Oh well, is um. So you, you show your art. I I, I, th I have a sense of how you get your ideas. Uh huh. And uh, we've talked about a variety of mediums. My most recent ah, yes. series of work. I just uh, very recently had a show at Gallery A3, uh, a solo show, and they were mono prints of butterflies. All of them were of oh, butterflies. And yes. So, so they're, they're all of in a family of color, too. And they are very much uh, in, in a family color. And they are also printed the same way as this monoprint. Each color is a separate time through the press. And sometimes uh, the shapes are created by either blocking out where the, uh, blocking out some of the ink plate so that when it goes through the press, only the part that's not blocked out will appear with the color and layering it's basically layering. layering and then the butterflies in many of these um, are put on by transfer drawing and transfer drawing is when you draw on a piece of paper the butterfly and um, then you turn it over and you roll on oil paint and once it's a little bit dry and tacky then you can put it down and you redraw your Oh. your butterfly and so it leaves the line work as colored ink. Janet Winston, it sounds like you're having a wonderful time. It sounds like you're playing. I am. Indeed. It's not far from your paper dolls. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> all these different techniques are just wonderful and it's just it's very exciting. Thank you for sharing with us. Well, I'm so glad you asked me. Thank you. I enjoyed being here. Good. So, um if there are some questions that I'm not asking the artists and you'd like me to, please email me at the 
address below and I will respond and I'll make sure to include those questions. Meantime, thank you for joining us. I'm Jane Treger, my guest was Janet Winston, and we're here at the Deerfield Arts Bank. And see you next time. <laughs>